Good evening and welcome to our special coverage of Governor Snyder's State of the State Address. Some are calling this the most important State of the State Address, uh, certainly of his career thus far. That's right. Devin and sources tell Local 4 the majority of this address will deal with the ongoing water crisis in Flint. A crisis that will likely overshadow past achievements over the course of his two terms. There is word that the governor is going to call on lawmakers to approve an aid package for Flint. Uh, that would include uh, ongoing water testing, lead testing. Uh, it would also include a call for money to prevent water shutoffs to customers. And there you see a live... Uh picture from Lansing today. You know, just today, two more class action lawsuits were filed over the state's handling of the water crisis. And of course, the White House is appointing someone from the Health and Human Services Department to lead the federal efforts to help the city of Flint. In fact, we had the Flint mayor in Washington yeah. today. Now, in addition to Flint, though, there are other issues facing the state. Governor expected to address the ongoing problems in Detroit public schools and his plans for moving ahead. Of course, over the past couple of weeks, we've had these sick outs from teachers yeah. uh, shutting down down some schools to protest everything from class sizes to pay to the building conditions that we've showed you with the uh, mushrooms growing on the wall, dead rodents and the like. Uh, the governor's plan to split the district in order to deal with the debt. Uh, that's just on Detroit education. So there you're talking about two enormous issues in Detroit schools and the Flint water crisis. Uh, and, and of course, if you're out state, you see a lot of other issues that he needs to try and, well, and cover as well. Both of these issues have gained national attention and certainly there are questions over writing questions that have to be answered. For example, not with Detroit, but certainly with the water crisis, is what did the governor know and when did he know it? And we still haven't gotten a definitive answer on, on either one of those questions because they need to know that. And we've certainly seen protesters uh, who have gathered in Lansing tonight to, to protest the governor as he uh, delivers the state of the state address. And so perhaps he is going to address that in this very, very important speech tonight. We would certainly expect so. There you see the Lieutenant Governor, Brian Kelly, as we just are about ready to get things underway here. As Carmen mentioned, the protests, a uh, pretty big and crowd the outside the state capitol at this hour right table. now of those uh, who've gathered uh, to uh, do everything from uh, ask for more help from Flint to even more extreme uh, demands like uh, that the governor step down. Uh, some have even suggested he should be arrested uh, for what has happened uh, in Flint. Uh, but uh, that is, we expect probably 65 to 70 percent of the dress to address tonight is going to be devoted to the situation in Flint. And Devin, as you can hear, uh, the uh, legislature is, uh, uh, legislators are applauding him as the governor makes his way uh, to the podium to uh, deliver what many are saying is probably one of the most important speeches of his political career. And Got his so, family with him. There you see his wife, Sue, in the uh, purple dress there to his uh, right. And, you know, she's advised him pretty much all along the way here. I, you would love to wonder what she's uh, telling him or advising him today. Well, we have seen a shift in the governor's uh, reaction to what happened in Flint over these last couple of weeks. Uh, some were uh, very disappointed in what seemed to be a real reticence uh, to grasp the truth of what was going on in Flint. And here in the last week, you've heard the governor apologize uh, time and again and uh, now flatly calling what happened in Flint a real disaster. In fact, he also called it his Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. if he had to coin a phrase, and uh, certainly it's not something that he's taking very lightly. Yeah, it's see. very interesting to watch, of course, just as it was the last week and watching uh, the uh, president's address. It's going to be very interesting uh, watching uh, the ebb and flow of, uh, because it, 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 it gets down to politics, of course, watching the ebb and flow of the Republicans and Democrats in the room and the way that they respond uh, to what the governor has to say tonight. Well, you know, he uh, normally does not speak from a a written text, and uh, today I think that probably nope. might not be the case. I think he may uh, decide to, to address this head on. Well, no teleprompter, though, we've been told. So. And that's in keeping with yep. the past tradition. Uh, just quickly uh, to let you know exactly uh, the schedule here for this evening. We'll uh, hear the governor's address here. You'll see that live here on Local 4. Uh, we will, uh, if you, if you want to, after the address is over, you want to explore it more with us, or we will be uh, bringing you a webcast on clickondetroit.com, a conversation that will continue with Sheila Cockrell and Paul Welday as we dig down deeper into what the governor has to say. Well, he is certainly uh, in front of the microphone now, and uh, let's take a listen.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Members of the Joint Convention, the Governor of the State of Michigan, Rick Schneider. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you for joining me tonight. To Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly, Speaker Kevin Cotter, Senate Majority Leader Arlen Meekoff, Senate Minority Leader Jim Ananick, House Minority Leader Tim Grimel, um, members of the Supreme Court, members of the Court of Appeals, Secretary of State Ruth Johnson, Attorney General Bill Schutte, Congressman Fred Upton, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, my cabinet, ladies and gentlemen of the legislature, fellow public servants, citizens of Michigan, and my family, I welcome you here tonight. I'd like to begin by also adding a special welcome, and that's to our active duty military, reserve, and National Guard members, members of law enforcement, and our veterans. Let's give them a shout out too, please, thank you. I do want to share one special situation with you with respect to our military. Um, last year, we had deployed the 127th Air Wing out of Selfridge. The 127th has two key elements until, in terms of their aircraft. They have the A-10 Warthog, which is a close air support unit that was actually deployed in the Middle East, dealing with terrorists, other issues over there, flying sorties. It also is the K-135 tanker, which actually was deployed refueling aircraft like the Warthog and other aircraft to make sure they could run those missions. We should be so proud. Our A-10 pilots actually flew roughly the equivalent of three years worth of flying in six months. In terms of the KC-135 pilots and their teams, their crews, all of them together, they did incredible work. They actually have a very special mission critical role that they had a special inspection take place why they were deployed. And they did something that had never been achieved in the history of the Air Force, not just the Air Guard. They actually had an inspection where they showed 100% of the members of that unit received 100%. They were perfect. And so that shows the spirit of Michiganders. And to recognize them, I'm very proud to say we have Brigadier General Leonard Isabel, the Commander of Michigan Air National Guard. We have Brigadier General John Slocum, the 127th Wing Commander with us from Selfridge. And we have Command Sergeant Major Daniel Lincoln, our State Command Sergeant Major. If you could all rise and if we could give them recognition for their incredible effort. They returned right before Christmas and I was happy to say I had the opportunity to attend the returning ceremony and when I heard about their incredible accomplishments, I had to share it with you because it's the best of Michigan to show they were, what they were doing in harm's way to keep us safe. In addition, it's important we recognize we have over 400 Michigan National Guard members currently serving overseas as I speak today. And all of Michigan should be glad to hear that Amir Hekmati of Flint, a Marine veteran, was finally released from Iran and will be welcoming home here soon in Michigan. And before I begin in terms of the speech itself, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for all those who have fallen in protection of our communities and in defense of our country. 
Thank you. Tonight will be a different State of the State address. There is so much we could discuss about how we can make our great state even better, stronger, over the next year. But tonight, I will address the crisis in Flint first and in depth. To begin, I'd like to address the people of Flint. Your families face a crisis, a crisis you did not create and could not have prevented. I want to speak directly, honestly, and sincerely to let you know we are praying for you, we are working hard for you, and we are absolutely committed to taking the right steps to effectively solve this crisis. To you, the people of Flint, I say tonight, as I have before, I am sorry and I will fix it. No citizen of this great state should endure this kind of catastrophe. Government failed you, federal, state, and local leaders, by breaking the trust you placed in us. I'm sorry most of all that I let you down. You deserve better. You deserve accountability. You deserve to know that the buck, buck stops here with me. Most of all, you deserve to know the truth, and I have a responsibility to tell the truth. The truth about what we've done, and what we'll do to overcome this challenge. Tomorrow I will release my 2014 and 2015 emails regarding Flint to you, the citizens, so you will have answers to your questions about what we've done and what we're doing to make this right for the families of Flint. Anyone will be able to read this information for themselves at michigan.gov slash Snyder. Because the most important thing we can do right now is to work hard and work together for the people of Flint. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. I know apologies won't make up for the mistakes that were made. Nothing will. But I take full responsibility to fix the problem so it will never happen again. Let me tell you what's been done so far and what we'll be doing in the coming days, weeks, months, and years to keep our commitment to you, to make Flint an even cleaner, safer, stronger city than it was before. Because that's what you and your families deserve. We are working to do whatever we must until this crisis is resolved. The people of Flint have chosen a new mayor. And I'm personally commit to work hand in hand with Mayor Weaver so we can rebuild the trust that's been broken. I've already taken steps to bring new leadership to the Department of Environmental Quality. These are individuals who understand the severity of the problem and who will effectively communicate to the people of the state. For those whose mistakes contributed to this disaster, we are fully cooperating with investigations and will hold those individuals accountable. And let me be perfectly clear to all of state government, and the, in situations like this, they must come to my desk immediately, no delays, no excuses, period. provide resources to help anyone and everyone that is affected, just as we've provided since we first learned of this crisis. In addition to emails, tonight I'm releasing a comprehensive timeline of the steps we've taken and the actions underway to solve this crisis. Let me walk you through the facts. First, this crisis began in the spring of 2013 when the Flint City Council voted 7-1 to one to buy water from the Karagandi Water Authority, the KWA. Former Flint Mayor Walling supported the move, and the emergency manager approved the plan. DWSD, the Department of Detroit Water and Sewer Department, provided notice of termination 
Effective one year later, and on April 25, 2014, Flint began to use water from the Flint River as an interim source. Second, soon after the switch from Detroit water to Flint River water, residents complained about the water, the color, the smell, rashes and concerns with bacteria. Ultimately, localized boil water advisories were issued by the city of Flint in August and September of 2014, each lasting several days. Third, the Department of Environmental Quality and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency began communicating about lead concerns in February 2015. Sadly, both were ineffective in fully addressing and solving the problem. DEQ misinterpreted the water safety regulations, and EPA did not act with sufficient urgency to address the concerns of one of its experts about DEQ's approach and the risk of lead contamination. In May 2015, lead service lines to one residence were removed and replaced due to high lead service levels. But still, they both failed to systematically identify and solve the problem. Fourth, in July 2015, my office proactively asked about the quality of Flint's water, test results, and blood testing. The DEQ told us that Flint was in compliance with the lead and copper rule, they told us there was one concern with one house that was corrected and there was nothing widespread to address. The Department of Health and Human Services also told us that the elevated blood lead levels were to be expected because they followed a normal seasonal trend. These conclusions were later shown to be incorrect when the Department of Health and Human Services conducted a deeper analysis of the relevant data. Fifth, in May, Professor Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha sounded an alarm about lead in Flint's water. But the, tragically, based on what DEQ and the Department of Health and Human Services had seen on the ground, they initially failed to reach the same conclusion. I want to thank the professor, the doctor, and the concerned pastors of Flint for bringing this issue to light. We are actively investigating why these agencies got it so wrong. And I believe we have Dr. Atisha Hicks Atisha with us here tonight, and I'd like to recognize her. If you could rise, please. Dr. Hannah Atisha, I apologize. I always call you Dr. Mona. Sixth, on September 28, 2015, I was first briefed on the potential scope and magnitude of the crisis on a phone call with DEQ and DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services. On October 1, 2015, DHHS epidemiologist validated Dr. Hannah Atisha's findings confirming the lead problem in Flint's water supply. At this point, I immediately ordered them to develop and implement a 10-point plan that included the immediate distribution of water filters, immediate testing water in schools, expanded water and blood testing for anyone that might be exposed. About 12,000 filters were distributed, 700 water tests, and 2,000 blood tests were conducted within the first three months. 7th, on October 8th, I announced that the Flint water system would be reconnected to the Detroit water system to minimize any further damage. And later that month, I announced the Independent Flint Water Task Force to review actions that had occurred so far and to make recommendations to address the crisis. 8th, the task force issued its initial actionable recommendations and identified critical problems in mid-December. Specifically, they pointed to a primary failure of leadership at the DEQ and a culture that led to this crisis. The task force was right, and I immediately took action, appointing new leadership at the department. Ninth, I declared an emergency in Flint on January 5th so we could access additional resources and mobilize additional support, including the Michigan State Police and the Michigan National Guard. These critical resources were needed to help families get clean water and any, end any risk or exposure for every resident of Flint. 
I also requested a presidential declaration of federal emergency, which was granted. And to the members of our congressional delegation who are here tonight, this is a challenge we must work together to solve, and I look forward to working with you to bring additional support from the federal government to the people of Flint. Tenth, to date, more than 37,300 cases of water, more than 53,700 water filters, and more than 7,300 water testing kits have been distributed. More than 21,300 homes have been visited. This is not enough. I'm increasing the support from the Michigan National Guard starting tomorrow to ensure that every home we need to visit in Flint gets visited as soon as possible. And I'm appealing the President's decision not to grant a major disaster declaration. We'll continue to deliver water, filters. We will not stop working for the people of Flint until every single person has clean water every single day, no matter what. That's why today I made an official request of the legislature to fund a series of immediate actions to provide everyone in Flint clean water and care for Flint's children. In addition to the $9 million supplemental appropriation for Flint made in October 2015, the request today is for $28 million with $22 million from the general fund. It includes additional bottled water, filters, replacement filters for anyone that needs these resources. Assistance to the City of Flint to help with utility-related issues. Testing and replacing fixtures in schools, daycare facilities, and other high-risk locations. Treatment of children with high lead levels, including diagnostic testing, nurse visits, nutritional counseling, and environmental assessments. Services will be available for the treatment of potential behavioral health issues, such as ADHD, for those who have had or could have had elevated blood lead levels. We'll also work with local primary care providers and hospitals to educate the community about toxic stress and how to de identify developmental delays. Support for children and adolescent health centers and additional support for children's health care access. An infrastructure integrity study for pipes and connections using outside independent experts. An important note, this will not be the last budget request for Flint. Additional resources will be needed for water-related needs, health-related needs, educational needs, economic development needs, and more. If you would also like to aid Flint, please go to helpforflint.com, all spelled out, to volunteer or donate. If you are a Flint resident who needs help getting the water you need, go to helpforflint.com. These are the facts of what we've done and what we're doing. But just as important as solving short-term needs and improving any long-term solutions, we need to make sure this never happens again in any Michigan city. We began this process by creating the Independent Flint Water Task Force and asking them to report on exactly what happened, what accountability measures must be in place, and what investments need to be implemented. This month, I issued an executive order to ensure that state and local leaders have everything they need to clean up this mess, ensure that anyone with lingering health care concerns is quickly, compassionately, and effectively treated. I know there will be long-term consequences, but I want you to know that we'll be there with long-term solutions for as long as it takes to make this right. There can be no excuse. When Michiganders turn on the tap, they expect and deserve clean, safe water. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. So that's what we'll deliver. To the families in Flint, 
It is my responsibility, my commitment to deliver. I give you my commitment that Michigan will not let you down. In addition to the issues in Flint, we have a statewide infrastructure challenge. Flint is not alone. Michigan is not unique. We have a national problem with our infrastructure. Michigan's infrastructure was ranked D by the American Society for Civil Engineers. Worse than national ranking, which was a D plus. We need to get this right in Michigan for the long term. We need to invest more and smarter in our infrastructure so we can avoid crises like this in the future. One great illustration of success was roads. Just this last year, we made the largest investment in transportation funding over the last half century. It's going to allow us to fill potholes, rebuild roads, and make bridges safer. And I want to thank the Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader and all your members for that leadership in making this happen. Thank you. But more than roads, we have a hidden problem. We see the rusting bridges. We drive on the roads and feel the potholes and crack concrete. But underground, some pipes are over 100 years old. Some are made of wood, others made of lead. Many burst in the winter. Out of sight, out of mind, until we have water problems, our power goes out, our sewer backs up from a flood, or our freeways flood because the pumps don't work. Lead pipes, aging natural gas infrastructure, wastewater overflows, energy reliability, ports needing emergency dredging, line five underneath the Great Lakes, even the Sioux locks. We need to have better solutions. We can come up with better solutions. One illustration I want to note is we've made progress with respect to iron pipes for natural gas transmission. Across Michigan, we have many miles of aging iron pipes for natural gas. This isn't a theoretical risk. There is a real risk there. I want to compliment the Michigan Public Service Commission back in 2011 for identifying this problem and starting to take action. They made a commitment that required raising rates, but we've started to replace a number of those old cast iron pipes to make it safer for people, for the environment. We were smart. We began the process when costs were low, so we could afford to replace those pipes. We still have many more pipes to go, though. This is the kind of problem solving we need in the future. Now, here are some actions we can immediately take on our infrastructure. First, I want to issue an executive order, I will issue an executive order to the Michigan Department of Transportation that they will confer with local officials and utilities every time we do a new road project because it's the best opportunity quite often to replace that aging infrastructure underneath those roads when that road is torn up. We can save money, we can do this smarter. I ask the legislature to consider looking at the same issue when local government does road projects and how we can partner to say if those roads are torn up, let's do more while we have that opportunity. When lead investigations are made in the state, we don't currently do this, but we should be checking water sources in critical areas, in addition to checking for paint, dust, and other environmental factors. We should be ensuring that all schools in Michigan test for lead, putting a priority on those in areas where we know they have aging infrastructure or lead problems in the past. And we should be increasing nutritional and lead education efforts in schools as well. Now, overall, we need a smart strategic plan for all of this. It requires an honest assessment of the challenges, opportunities, and costs. That's why I will be creating the Commission for Building the 21st Century Infrastructure. We need experts steeped in credibility and clout, visionary leaders committed to Michigan's future. They'll study what Michigan needs, develop a plan for making the right investments in water, sewer, transportation, broadband, and other areas and also discuss how we will pay for these investments. And I'll ask for their report in September of this year. In addition to infrastructure in Flint, I now want to talk about Detroit and education. 
Great challenges cannot be addressed without hard work, long hours, and true partnership with the communities in need of new hope and a fresh start. But solving them is not impossible, and certainly not without precedent. Let's look at Detroit, one year after leaving bankruptcy. As Detroit continues to rebuild, it should give every city in this great state the hope and belief that we can deliver new opportunities for everyone. Who would have dreamed possible that the idea that just a year after bankruptcy, our state's largest city has become a hub for innovation and excitement? There's dynamic economic growth in the downtown and midtown, and it's keeping and drawing young people to our state. It's important to note there's much more work that needs to be done, especially in the neighborhoods. But progress is evident everywhere. There are over 59,000 lights have been turned on, more than 7,600 structures demolished since 2014. Violent crime is down 18% since 2012. We're showing what Detroit can do. And as part of that, I would ask recognition for Mayor Mike Duggan, who's with us tonight. Mike, please stand up. Thank you for your partnership in helping rebuild a great city. Though our recent work in Detroit gives us a measure of pride, Detroit schools are in a crisis. The Detroit schools are in need of a transformational change. Too many schools are failing at their central task of preparing our young Michiganders for a successful, rewarding life. Simply put, not all Detroit students are getting the education they deserve. This is a large problem. Nearly 100 schools in Detroit public schools, 60 charter schools in and around the city, 15 educational achievement schools, several adjacent, school, several adjacent charter and school districts. Yet parents can't find the quality education they seek. One of the issues is Detroit public schools are deeply in debt. By this summer, it'll be over $515 million in debt. To achieve the needed academic outcomes, financial stability in Detroit public schools must be achieved. Over $1,100 per student is going to debt service and not the classroom. Let's solve this problem and help the kids. Taking prompt legislative action is needed to minimize the fiscal impact on both Detroit and the rest of Michigan. The time to act is now and avoid court intervention that could cost all of us much more and be much more detrimental. I want to thank Senator Hansen for the legislation and, and the input of many legislators that they provided over the last several months. And I ask you to move with great haste. Senator Hansen, please rise. We should be proud we have a West Michigan legislature taking the lead on solving Detroit public school issues. The Detroit Education Coalition also recommended a Detroit Education Commission to help students achieve better results in all Detroit schools. This is a good idea, but it hasn't drawn much support. We should keep looking at this key element to help Detroit's kids. The School Reform Office, working with Detroit public schools and local leaders, will actively address these issues in lieu of the Commission. All of us, from state and local officials, education to charitable and civic leaders, parents to concerned citizens, need to work together quickly. The challenges are well known, the alternatives are defined, now's the time to get something done. Great schools are critically important, both to the city of Detroit and the entire state of Michigan. Let's address this decades-long crisis now. Every Michigan child deserves an education that launches them into a successful career path in life. The best careers in the modern economy require training with access to programs that gives them the skills and experience necessary to prepare them for college, career, and for life. We've made progress. 
We've made some good reforms. We've added tougher academic standards without federal mandates. We've talked about teacher effectiveness. We're a national leader in funding preschool. We've created early literacy programs in terms of pre-3 reading. In terms of STEM programs, we're a leader with programs like FIRST and Square One. We've done some wonderful things with early and middle college programs. And we've made a commitment, I have made a commitment, to make sure that we're the nation's leader in career technical education. These are all great opportunities. We can see the great potential of our children when we see these things. And one illustration I would note to you tonight, hopefully you got that program. Because I want to recognize the wonderful young student that designed that program cover. And if you could rise, we have Elena Keel up in the gallery from 7th grade in New Baltimore, Anchor Bay Middle School. <laughs> Elena, you're the future of our state, and I appreciate your parents bringing you here tonight. I like that thumbs up. But, all of us, whether we're a policy leader, an educator, or a community leader, for a parent or a student, we all have to have some accountability for achieving these outcomes. And to be blunt, we have a 19th century education system in the 21st century. It's time to ask ourselves why. We have two comprehensive studies coming in 2016 to help with this issue, one on school funding and another on career and technical education. We've done some wonderful task force with actionable items. One that I'm particularly proud of is what we did with pre-3 reading that was completed. We have another one coming soon in special education in terms of the recommendations and we have one on STEM coming. But more needs to be done. I want to recognize the partnership of our state superintendent, the state board. Brian Whiston has done a great job. He actually went through a very complicated process with multiple stakeholders and developed an excellent set of goals to make Michigan a top 10 state in 10 years. Brian, please stand up so we can recognize you. I want to show partnership with the state superintendent and the state board of education by creating a commission for a 21st century education. Again, let's do a bipartisan, multi-stakeholder effort to look at all these studies, all these recommendations, to investigate what have been the obstacles holding us back from greater success. And let's deliver recommendations to building Michigan's educational future. The goals we want to achieve. What's the appropriate structure? What's the appropriate governance? And how do we fund it? And I ask that this commission will deliver the results by the end of November. Now let me transition to talking about our economic future in this state. Our economy might seem good today, but we need to take action to make sure it's good in the future. We should not take it for granted. That's how we had the mess of the last decade. In terms of accomplish, accomplishments, we should be proud from a job creation point of view. Since December of 2010, we've created over 420,000 private sector jobs. We rank number six in the nation. That equates to 232 new jobs every single day in the state. We're num We are number one in the nation in manufacturing job growth. Our unemployment rate it has been cut by more than half since December 2010. We're third in the nation for the largest reduction in unemployment in that time period. Importantly with it though, it's not just about more people working. Personal income is increasing again in Michigan. We saw a huge drop in that last decade, the lost decade. I'm proud to say in 2014 it increased 3.9%, more than doubling the prior year's growth rate of 1.4%. But it's important to remember that not everyone has participated in this comeback. And we need to take special efforts to make sure the people and places 
that have not participated join us. We have created programs to do this, but we need to continue to ramp them up. With respect to our urban areas, in particular places like Detroit, Flint, Pontiac, and Saginaw, one program I'm particularly proud of, and we have a number of others, but it's Community Ventures. It was a program we built with solely state resources because we wanted the flexibility to find out what needed to be done and get it done. And it has been successful. It has now employed over 4,000 people by partnering with 110 companies. Its retention rate after one year is nearly 70%, 69%. And its wages on average are 11 .80, excuse me, $11.80 an hour. If you think about it, what a great start. But what I'll tell you is that's not a final point. That's a point to get people successfully working that haven't. Then we can apply traditional programs to give them upward mobility, more opportunity for a bright long-term future. In Flint alone, this program's accounted for 618 jobs already. We need to help other places, though. I mentioned our urban areas. But too often we forget we have rural communities, we have smaller communities that also suffer great poverty. And we cannot leave them behind either. So I'm proud to say last year we launched a program called Rising Tide. And the program is based on the premise to go to each one of our 10 regions in the state and identify a challenge community. We have gone to those challenge communities and said, we want to present a team of resources. It's not just about money, but people that can help. And we've got a collaborative effort between economic development resources, community development resources, and talent development resources all teaming together to go help those communities join the rest of us. As soon as we get those communities succeeding and we're starting to see progress, we will pick new communities to take their place. And we will keep on going down that list until we've cornered, covered every corner of Michigan. That's what we should be doing. Now, in terms of Michigan's economic future, if you look at the industries in Michigan, we have automotive, agriculture, and tourism. I like to say our big three. They're all doing well in the state, extraordinarily well in some ways. The one tonight in particular I want to talk about, though, is the automotive industry. We should be so proud. We set U.S. records for car sales in this country over the last 12 months, and next year is expected to be even better. Michigan has been the beneficiary of that. We are still the heart and soul of the auto industry. Make no mistake about that. We should carry a special pride with that. Over 70% of the research and development for the U.S. auto industry happens right here in Michigan, in addition to building more cars than any other state. But I want to share something with you. It has been a tremendous opportunity and a privilege for us to help support that industry and the wonderful, hardworking people on the lines building those cars, at the supplier base doing that hard work to make the world's best products. But we have a threat. I can tell you, if we did what we did in the past, we could lose the auto industry out of our state in terms of leadership. Why is that? Because the auto industry is transforming to something new. The world is changing. What is the automobile industry of today in 10 or 20 years will be called the mobility industry. It will be about how people travel, not just about the vehicle they travel in. And it's time now to understand we need to be looking towards the future, not just admiring the past. So this area in particular, we need to make investments. And we have started that process. We have made some good investments. The primary being the area of intelligent vehicles, autonomous and connected vehicles and smart infrastructure, and how it communicates with vehicles. Several years ago, we created something exciting in partnership with the University of Michigan and a lot of partners called the Michigan Mobility Transformation Center. This is actually a real project that you may not realize is taking place in southeastern Michigan. They literally have a test bed of thousands of connected vehicles talking to infrastructure even today. And when I say connected vehicles, do not worry. Many of you may confuse that with autonomous vehicles. These still have drivers in them. 
so you can feel safe on the road. But this is part of our future, and we need to do more. Just this last year, we did a partnership and launched something called the M-City. It's a 32-acre campus at the University of Michigan that is for testing autonomous and connected vehicles. A closed-loop system, it has many different environments. It is swamped. The auto industry has overwhelmed this place with demand because they're looking for a place to do this kind of work. So M-City is not good enough. So what I propose to you, and I've already been working in partnership with our congressional delegation, and I thank them for their efforts, is to look to create the American Center for Mobility at Willow Run. We have an opportunity to create over a 300-acre campus that would be the world's best place to test intelligent vehicles, whether autonomous and connected. And this place is critically important. The industry needs it, but we need to bring in the federal government and say this is the place where the standards for safe operation should take place, is right here in Michigan at Willow Run. And it can be the base for international standards. That's how we can help keep leadership of the auto industry in Michigan by making that future-looking investment and in doing the right thing to make sure that really exciting car you saw at the Detroit Auto Show in 10 years, just think, it will still have wheels, but it's a computer on wheels. We need a place like this to make sure we maintain our leadership for the long-term future. The last item I talked about, about automotive going to mobility, was an opportunity that could become a threat. Now I want to talk about something that's been a great opportunity for, for many years, but we face a major threat. It's the Sioux Locks. The Sioux Locks is something we always talk about and we're proud of, but often we don't talk about how important it is. More than 4,000 commercial ships a year use the locks annually. The locks are absolutely crucial to supplying the iron ore that makes the steel for all those vehicles I just talked about, and many of our appliances. If you look at it, most of the tonnage goes through one specific lock, the pole lock, because it's a thousand foot lock. The other locks cannot accommodate the carriers that we see. So the pole lock is absolutely critical to our future. The issue is there's one of them. And an analysis was done. What would happen if that one lock went down? It would devastate Michigan's economy. To be blunt, it could devastate the national economy. Think about it. We'd run out of steel. And this is the kind of steel that doesn't come from other places. It is based on the ore that comes through the Sioux locks. It's interesting if you look at the history. A second thousand foot lock was actually authorized, believe it or not, in 1986 by the federal government. Congress approved the second lock. They simply didn't allocate any money to build it. This is something we need to work with Congress on and getting done. And the important part of this is I'm proud to say we have partners within the federal government that we've been working well on making sure we explain this issue to the public, to the leaders in Washington, and a commitment to get it done. And I'd like to recognize two great partners, again, up in our gallery with our other military people. We have Captain Steve Teschendorf of the United States Coast Guard and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Sellers, Jr. of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. If you could please rise. Just as I mentioned, a commission on infrastructure, a commission on education. When those commissions get their work done, we need to aggregate this to talk about the economy of the future. So I am also going to appoint a commission on building the 21st century economy. Our economy is more productive than it has ever been in years. We're doing better, but better isn't good enough. 
We need to be committed to continuous improvement, delivering the healthy economy that Michigan deserves, one that provides opportunities for every Michigan, every person that wants to work hard, get ahead, and stay ahead. Let's build on that work of those first two commissions, but let's also add the concept of innovation and long-term economic tools and creating a culture of continuous innovation. And I'm proud to say we have a group that really represents that here tonight. I made a trip to the Upper Peninsula last year and I went and visited Northern Michigan University. And they took me to a place, I think it was an old bank branch. It wasn't even near campus that much. And I walked in and it was about students helping inventors. Bring I the inventors were walking in with ideas, the students were talking to those inventors about the ones that could be made into real products. And it's happening right up in Marquette today. This is a program that should be all throughout Michigan. Think about this, engaging our students with our inventors, creating new economic opportunities. It's exciting. And so I ask that you give recognition. Also with us tonight in that same section of the gallery is we have a group of students and some of their leaders from INVENT at NMU. Please rise. We need to create an environment that supports economic development and encourages business to grow. Opportunity needs to be part of our DNA in the state, and I'm going to ask them for the report by the end of December. Now in summary tonight, the challenges we face in Flint and Detroit and beyond are serious but solvable. The question is, can we come together today and a spirit of cooperation to find the solutions that people deserve? Or will we succumb to crisis and allow politics and finger-pointing to overcome the real needs of real people? We have to solve this challenge because every single citizen depends on us and we need to give them a better, brighter future. They deserve it to raise a family, to work hard, to get ahead. I'm personally committing the next three years of my administration to tirelessly work to ensure that the families of Flint can heal from this wound and that every Michigander enjoys the quality of life they deserve. To do this, I ask in return that your prayers include the people of Flint I ask for the continuing strong partnership, counsel, and commitment of all of our legislators gathered here. And I ask for the commitment of all of our citizens to work together as Michiganders with relentless positive action and to hold me accountable for results. I sought the office, I sought the office of Governor of Michigan to reinvent our state because we are broken in many ways. We've repaired and reinvented many critical items over the past five years, including issues that many didn't think could be solved. But the crisis in Flint makes it clear to me that more needs to be done. It is truly a humbling experience to see the people you work for and care for harmed by the people that work for you. But Michiganders don't quit. We don't give up. Instead, we'll work with even more passion and commitment to truly improve our state. For everyone who's chosen to make Michigan their home, this is more than a promise. This is my commitment. Thank you, and God bless Michigan and our nation. address uh, spending as we promised uh, the bulk of the lion's share of the time tonight talking about Flint 20 minutes there at the beginning of the address and then returning to that again as uh, he brings it to a close I've known Rick Snyder now for a long time I've never seen him as emotional as we saw him his here, voice actually uh, choked up a, yeah. a few times, a number of times. Devin. but 
I guess what I expected to hear too, and, and maybe I'm not just so sure that uh, it is elevated to the prominence or the 